everyone. Welcome to another episode of Unplug IT. I'm your host, Stephen Rose, and thanks for joining. A few quick things of business before we jump into today's episode. Do not forget about our Microsoft Teams Day on November 30th. I'll be doing a kickoff keynote, and uh, I have a great AMA with Anna Pompatnik, who is the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Teams, and we will answer all of your Teams questions. I also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Power Apps 911. I want to thank them so much for all of their great support and everything that they've done. Quick word from our sponsor, and then we will jump on with today's guest. Thanks, Stephen. Just a reminder to all of you, if you have Office 365, you have the Power Platform. Power Platform is a low-code, no-code platform that lets you build your own apps, workflows, reports, all without writing any of that hard code. If you want to learn more about it, you can go over to training.powerapps911.com. We've got on-demand training. We've got live training. We've got private training. We even have a whole immersive university program. Or heck, we'll even do the project for you if you don't want to get your hands too dirty. All right, back over to Stephen. Great. So I was sitting down thinking uh, while I was in Chicago about all of the amazing people in this industry that I've met and the amount of fantastic knowledge that they have. And I was having some beers with a good friend of mine and said, hey, if you could talk to your younger self or someone new coming into the industry, what would you share? And we had a really great conversation and I thought this would make a great show. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend, Tim Aberley. Tim, how are you, my friend? I am wonderful, Stephen. How are you today? I'm doing really well. So for the folks who don't know you, and I'm going to assume that's many of them, um, Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and uh, then we'll kind of jump into some of your experiences and advice. Absolutely. Yeah. So today I am a principal architect uh, for a Fortune 500 entertainment company that is uh, globally present, um, finishing, well, actually just starting my 24th year here. So uh, been here a while, seen a lot of change and a lot of things come along. And when I started, I was like a lot of people when they started. I arrived, they said, here's a list of machines you're responsible for. Hope you can find them, good luck. And I was a PC technician and kind of took care of everything back in the much more distributed days. And uh, over the years, uh, as we have grown as an organization, we've consolidated operations and done things for optimization. Uh, I have grown through the ranks uh, up into uh, where I sit today within our enterprise technology group. Our primary focus, if you will, is to be the IT outsourcer of choice internally, believe it or not. And we do operate that way. Uh, we are not necessarily a mandated, but we are a strongly suggested supplier of uh, pretty much most of the things that we would think of as non-technically differentiating. So collaborative, end user compute, mobile, whether that's email, SharePoint, uh, Teams, you know, voice, video, rooms, mm -hmm. Most of that stuff rolls up through our organization and a good chunk of that rolls up through me from an architecture uh, vision guidance and roadmap perspective. I think, what's, I think what's interesting is in the rodent themed organization company that you work for is you have every type of industry. You have banking, you have hospitality, you have finance. I mean, there is not a vertical that you don't deal with in some way or another. And that creates a lot of complexity as you're doing IT, working with different levels of access, governance, security, and all those sort of things. So as you're working on projects, I love the fact that, you know, one of the first things that you said to me is when I sit down with a project or a team, it is, what are we trying to accomplish? And who did we get that ask? from. Why is that important? I agree. What are we trying to accomplish? You should always do it. Or I always say, what does success look like? But why the who did we get that ask from? Why is that important? Yeah, I think one of the things we we experience as we grow is, you know, kind of an understanding of someone said, go do this. They appear to be an authoritative source. So I'm going to go do this. And a, a lot of folks do some very good work only to get to the point of delivering the solution and find out that, you know, the folks receiving the solution aren't as thrilled as we, we wish they would have been. And, and it turns out that while we built something wonderful, we built it based on what the IT department of a particular functional area 
told us their users wanted or what they believed they were trying to achieve. And we've sort of missed the context of who are we really here to help? So, you know, if I were only building IT systems for IT users, well, that would be great and interesting and, and certainly challenging enough. But realistically, you know, we're building things to help the various folks who actually do the work within our organizations succeed and right, some yeah, the end users we right we don't quite always get that uh, that information as cleanly as we would like to or or sometimes the feedback of you know hey that really didn't work it's not at all what we were hoping for and it turns out when we talked right. to the end users it worked wonderfully and it was exactly what they were hoping for it, it just left a little bit of it out of the loop that used to maybe be a little more hands-on in some of those situations. So it's vision, it's vision versus reality. So how do you, when somebody has a vision, but you know it's not the reality, this is not what those end users are going to want because you've worked with them, you've heard from them. How do you get IT to really sort of see, get away from what they, what how they visualize it to what it's actually going to do and how it's actually going to help people? Yeah, I think one of the first Things that I learned along the way when I when I finally had to leave the lab and talk to real people <laughs> who were using or or unfortunately were, were being inflicted upon, according to them, uh, some of the solutions right. we were coming up with at the time was don't don't assume that because you approach a compute device and a problem in a certain way that that's how the rest of the world looks to achieve Works, that right. challenge. And yeah. so. You know, it's very interesting, depending on the size of your organization, the nature of your company and everything. Sometimes those are very matrix roles. And we have folks embedded in our business that are supposed to be doing business analyst type work. You know, what is the business problem? What is the nature of the need? What, you know, don't don't use a technical term. Don't give me a solution. What are the things you need to achieve? And we also have folks that, you know, are more of what we would call in the organizations these days, customer success folks. And they kind of blend over the top where, you know, a lot of the business analysts are looking at what's it going to cost me? What can I save? Where can I leverage this? What about reuse? You know, the customer success folks are, are definitely more of the how do I touch it? What color should it be? Is this button big enough? And, you know, all of that matters eventually if you want somebody to adopt what you're doing. And more importantly, if you want to see that adoption as success. You know, did I achieve the thing I was hoping to do, which was, yes, do the financial and the fiscal and the responsible, make it bulletproof, make it cheaper, make it easier. But is it also loved in essence? And, you know, that's a sentiment and those things are tough to tough to quantify. And so for those of us that tend to look at models and want to quantify things and, you know, look at cause and effect, sometimes the fuzzy logic pieces, you know, there's there's no. And I will tell myself this now, and I wish I would have told myself this earlier, there is absolutely no substitute some days for just walking amongst the folks and seeing what they're doing and how they're doing it. Because occasionally you will look at something and go in a million years. I would not have approached it like that. But now that I see how you're approaching it, I absolutely understand why the solution I provided to you isn't what you were dreaming of at this point in time. And Sure. I love the phrase, and I, it brought me back to the movie Jurassic Park, which is you spent so much time figuring out if you could do it, no one stopped to think, should we do it? You did a version of this is just because we can, should we? What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that is something that, you know, it probably took me the first five or 10 years of my career to stop trying to be the trick pony and ask if we needed a trick pony. And, and I think that's where, as I get into rooms, um, I began to try to simplify this initially for myself, but sometimes, you know, for the room as a whole, you know, if, if I'm asking myself, do I understand what I'm trying to achieve and what does success look like? The first thing I should be able to do from an architecture lens, especially, is then sort of pivot back to the the quiver of arrows I have, so to speak, and what can I choose from here? Do I have the right size, the right number, the Because even if I agree with the dream, even if it's the absolute place we want to be, if I can't do it successfully with what I have today, then that's a good point of inflection where we stop. We say we don't give up and we don't say no. We ask ourselves, what are we missing? Because until I can do something, whether or not I should do something is a little bit irrelevant. And I've I've sat on a number of projects earlier in my career where 
you know, six months, seven months, eight months into a one year project, somebody is finally coming to the realization that we can't do what we promised someone we could do seven months ago. And, and there's not a lot of hope that we're going to achieve it in the next three months. So I got a little bit smarter about sort of taking the big things and, and trying to be a little more prescriptive about smaller bites along the way and points of decision along the way that made sense. If I can't do it today, why not? And what do I right. need to be able to accomplish it? Do I need more of something that I already have? That's one problem. Do I need something unique or different that I've never had before? Different problem yet again. Or do I need to work with the folks who provide me the solutions I have today and see about enhancing those? Ideally, in a way that's going to make both of us happy, it's going to let me adopt the product the way I need to. And hopefully it's going to make it a better product so when they want to sell it to someone else, this is another use case they can check off. And so the can we problem was, was really where we would start. And then we'd work past that to say, okay, if we can now, should we do this? And, and that's really the lens where I, I have a lot more fun these days because I have a lot of folks who want to do things all day long. And yes, those are interesting things. And yes, we could do those things. But what do we perceive the outcome of doing that to be these days? And, and how do we elevate that discussion into terms that, you know, business leaders can follow, IT leaders can follow. And, and so, you know, it's, it's a different dialogue and it's not quite the same technical terms that I may be used to use. If I walked into the room and dazzled right. you with all the words that prove I know what I'm doing, uh, most of you have left the conversation virtually or physically long before we get to the, <laughs> the important parts. So, you know, that's a skill I've had to work on just, you know, okay, you know it, everyone knows you know it, or you wouldn't be in right. this. Stop proving you know it and start getting the right level of, of tone and tenor in your conversation. I think you bring up something interesting, and that is to walk away from a project. And I think that's something that people early in their career are afraid to do because it will look like failure. And if I walk away from this, I might get fired. But if you continue with that project and can't fulfill it, you're dragging that out and spending a lot of money. I know at uh, Microsoft, Satya would say very often, if you're going to fail, fail fast, learn from it and move on. How did you deal, you know, how did you first, one of the first times you dealt with it, realized that a project, this is not going to work the way that people want it to. And I need to stop this now before it becomes a, a quicksand, uh, both for your future and, and potentially financially and for the company. How do you, how do you get that vision? How do you make that call? Yeah, that's a difficult one. And, you know, for all the reasons you mentioned, um, I think part of that was, was again, the sooner that message becomes apparent and the more readily you're willing to deliver that message, I think the more simple that message becomes, it's never easy to go in and tell someone, I don't think we can do something that maybe I thought we could do before. But I think one of the things I've learned to do more effectively, it's not always received as effectively, but you know, you have to keep hammering it home, is let's assess and assess often and understand the next step, right? I, and I remember this years, years and years ago, one of the first larger adoption projects I, I was involved in here was, you know, the old perennial, every three years we get a new version of Office and oh God, what's that gonna mean? And I sat down as a participating engineer in a project that someone else was leading at the time. And I thought it was interesting because the product hadn't officially released. I couldn't even consume the release notes yet to understand what was going to change. And when I walked in, right. the first thing on the board was our two-year plan for adoption. And I thought, well, that was wow. very interesting. How did we arrive at the two-year plan? Well, it always takes us two years. We have three months for testing. We have three months for you know whatever we find in testing. We have early adopters for three months, and then we roll for the rest of the, the period as we can. And I thought, well, that's that's a unique way to look at it. But if you start with the answer, and then you keep bending the edges to make it fit the box, that's probably not the way we want to do this. Right. And instead, we, we kind of flipped it a little differently. I said, what if we accelerate the work in the first two months, and then we stop and ask, what do we think this tells us about our ability, compatibility fixes, things like that. Because if 85% of the stuff just works, that's a good number on aggregate. But if the 15% that doesn't work are my mission critical enterprise wide applications, then I'm probably not going anywhere very quickly 
until we address those. And so numbers on aggregate mm -hmm. are interesting, but numbers in particular are really where you need to start forming the message, right? And so then you have to kind of soft pedal that back, right? You know, I can certainly go with the timeline you guys have proposed here, but weirdly enough, if if we start rolling this in, in six months and these guys all have fixes due in eight, I think we're going to do a lot of work to start and not be able to go very many places. So right. what if we propose rolling it in eight and if we can accelerate areas that don't use these for any reason, they can be early adopters and we can still achieve this and get it in in a year instead of two years. What do you think about that? Right. And, and some people think right. that's great. some people still look at the two year plan. So you're always going to have something you need to work around, but it's yeah. the right decision makers and then ideally aligning with the decisions they want to make as well, right? No senior executive wants to look poor in front of their peers either, and they're trusting you whether oh, they're explicitly yeah. or not to make sure they don't. And so I think that was one of the early lessons is I watched someone crash and burn near me. And in the whole time, it was like, this is not going to work. We need to tell somebody. Well, right. we don't want to disappoint them, but your only choice will be to disappoint them because it's not going to work. No, so, and that's going to happen. Yeah. It, that ranks up there with if you're going to do a project, it either has a start date or an end date. You can't have both. If you're going to pick a date it's due, then you work backwards to this is when we need to start it. Or you say, if we're going to start this day, I will tell you where it ends. But you can't pick a start and an end date. That just that doesn't work. I learned that my first week in business school. One of the few things that I remember, but it served me well. I think along that line, and another thing that you mentioned earlier, and I thought this is great, and this has always been a question for me, which is, as I look at IT, I look at two different types of projects. I look at evolutionary. This is good. Here's what we need to do to make it better, get more people to use it, add updates to it, natural progression. And then there is revolution, things that are going to change the way that we work, that are going to take a lot more on the front end, that you may go down a path that doesn't work, but if they do, they can open up new business opportunities. Along that line of pivot and evolve, which is one of the things that you said when we were chatting. So how do you balance revolution and evolution? How do you balance pivot and evolve? Uh, and, you know, just that whole, this is totally new ground. How do we look at that? How do you balance those types of projects or ask, or what are some things that you've learned when people come to you with evolution or revolution type um, ask? Yeah, I think the biggest thing we learned, and, and we didn't learn this organically necessarily, um, it was more of a, here's how we've always done it versus, well, okay, then I want to tip the apple cart if that's how we've always done it. And, you know, interestingly right. enough, in there is a balance, right? And so all change is disruptive. Disruption and change are not necessarily bad, but they need to be understood and they need to absolutely be bought in, not necessarily from the leaders of the folks involved, but by the people involved themselves. And, you know, we chose to be thoughtful here about platform moves. And, and to be fair, I chose sometimes to be thoughtful, even though it was difficult to stand on that rock as others were, were throwing things at you. But if I'm going to disrupt somebody this year and I'm going to swap out their office platform and 70 percent of everything they work with is going to have to be touched, tested, evaluated, and in some cases remediated. And those are not insignificant amounts of time and effort and money in a, a corporation our size. And the next year comes the operating system. Well, what if thoughtfully we choose to be ever so slightly behind on our office platform while we wait for the operating system platform and we treat that as a true platform uplift. And one of the kind of watershed moments for us, and, and I knew I was going to take it on the chin by saying this, but we did it anyway, is, you know, in the transition from the Windows XP to Windows 7 days, we said, we are we going to transition the operating system platform, but we're going to transition our version of Office at the same time. And everyone was shocked. How, how could you do this? Well, it gets worse, people. I'm not only going to do that, but I'm going to take my 32-bit antiquated operating system platform and I'm going to force everybody into 64-bit. So we are going to break everything on purpose. And then we're going to fix things 
in a meaningful way that's going to buy us another five or so years to go deal with the outliers and the stragglers. And it absolutely meant making some unpopular decisions. My really old 16-bit apps didn't have a path forward anymore. My people were not thrilled. But the alternative was you, you can stay where you are, but not for much longer. That's end of life. And so that became a debate of how much is too much or how many times do we want to reassess the same real estate? And in the end, it it was a challenge. It was a little painful. Uh, we, we certainly heard our fair share of, but everything's broken. Yeah, but think of all the fun. We can have one project over one year and fix it all and, and be good again for a while. And, you know, that that was one where it really came down to, you know, my belief in something that I was able to prove out as a cost benefit only after going through it, right? And it was a little bit of historical data of what does it generally cost us to go through one of these efforts? I'm gonna do this once, add maybe three months to it, instead of doing it three times over five years at triple the cost. Right. It's interesting because I know so many companies, because I led our Windows 7 deployment and did that XP to Windows 7 in 30 minutes off a USB stick using uh, you know USMT and things like that. Thank you, Jeremy Chapman, again, for helping me with all that. But, but um, what was interesting was a lot of companies chose to do the OS and the Office 2010 at the same time, saying they already have stuff to learn. We may as well just throw in a little bit more with that. And I will tell you, the companies that did the OS and Office at the same time were actually more successful than the ones that drug it out because people said, well, I got to learn this just to get my job done. And everybody was at the same place rather than have this sort of staggered thing where users, some were ahead and some were behind, and it just created a lot of angst um, around that level. So as you look back, was that the right decision? Would you, what would you have done differently as you were facing, you know, uh, Windows XP end of life, Office end of life, and all that server end of life was also hitting at that time? There were yeah. a lot of things that were changed. The cloud was just starting to come in. What is something that you might do differently today? And I'm not saying that you have regret. It's just, again, that experience, whether it was a process or the way that you looked at something. Yeah, I think, you know, like, like everything, some of the best designs I ever came up with at the moment in time, I thought they were the best designs ever or some of the most tragic ones I review today. But they were the best things we could do at that moment in time with what we had available and I think that's right. a good lens to remember, right? I, I am as critical of things I did in the past as I'll probably be of things I'm doing right now in the future. But sometimes you get to a point where you have to say, okay, this is the best I could possibly do. I think in, in retrospect, the one thing I probably would have done, and this is where I picked up a lot of this, is we were trying to make this an IT and IT to IT leadership push. And so... Mm -hmm. Enterprise IT was driving the change. All of the corporate IT segments were saying, oh, my God, what is this going to cost us? And early on, we didn't really look for that. I'll call it that tiebreaker moment. Um, what was very interesting is at one point I sat back with one of our project people at the time who said, yeah, 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 we've been through 24 slides here. I don't care. But there are 24 slides. We worked a long time on those and it's got a great message right. about what works and what doesn't. And what do I get out of this was her exact quote. Right. Well, what do you mean? Why should you get something out of this? This is just something we have to do. I mean, things are end of life. We can't keep them forever. We have to move. But why? Why would I want to move? Right. What is, the, what is the benefit that I will personally see? The with them, the what's it, in it for me. Exactly. Yeah. And the sad thing was, is we were at a bit of a log jam with a couple of our larger segments on well, you know, we can go to the board and we can vote on this. And if it's five to five, tie wins, we get what we want. And it's like, no, nope, that's not really one of these moments. So she happened to mention one of the coolest things that she saw five seconds after she saw it was one of the things I thought, well, that's just silly. Um, snap in Windows 7. Yeah. The minute she could just drag two windows and boom, Excel spreadsheets in multiple windows now, the combination of Office and Windows 7 together, she immediately said, that's going to help me get my work done faster. I want that. Who do I talk to? Right. And so we, we turned around and realized again that the actual group we were solving problems for wasn't the other IT group after all. It was right. the folks who were going to have to consume this change. And I think that helped validate the, the concept that you were mentioning, which is 
do I feed change into this pipe continuously to the point where it's just never stopping and people mm -hmm. get tired? I don't want the next thing. Yeah. I like the thing I have. Or do we do it reflectively and thoughtfully in chunks that are consumable, but also have something in it for the end user community directly? It's like, I want this thing. Who do I call? Where do I send my leader to ratchet up the pressure on my IT folks? Because if you're telling me I can't have this because my apps don't work and these people aren't willing to do anything with those apps, I'll go fight that battle for you. And suddenly I had a lot less battles to fight. I just needed to arm right. the right people who were willing to fight the battles with the things they needed to make their business cases. But then you have the other side of this, which is something, let's say, like Copilot, where companies are like, gimme, 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 I got to have that. I saw this great cartoon, like, you know, this all these things that Copilot you know, could potentially do or AI can do. And they're like, so why do we want it? It's like, I don't know, but everybody else has it and they want to have it. It's going to be this great game changer, but we can't prove it. I had a great chance while I was in Orlando and Chicago to talk to folks who are like, yeah, we want Copilot. I'm like, okay, what are you doing to prep? For what research have you done? How have you cleaned your data? How will you train your end users? You have to buy 300 licenses. So you have all of these things that you're going to have to do internally to prepare to make that work. We also have, what is it, 70% of employees are now using Copilot, 40% are putting confidential, or not Copilot, but ChatGPT, 40% are putting confidential information in there. So you have that other end of the spectrum where people want it, but they don't understand what goes into it and why you don't just want to jump feet first into some technologies. You want to do your due diligence and go through. So how do you separate those moments and how do you convince somebody, I know you want this because they've read the hype, but is this really going to do what as advertised the way that people expect it to? How do you set those expectations for someone or say, yeah. you need to take that down enough? Yeah. And that, that's hard that's, to do. That's become the, the greatest challenge for, I think, a lot of folks in my position in the last three to five years as we've, yeah. you know, in quotes, democratized IT. We haven't right. democratized risk and responsibility. And so mm -hmm. for us, it's kind of let's take it away from the no, you can't have the candy conversations again and try to get in front of the what is the potential risk and what is the liability? Because more and more of IT today, and especially in, in my level, is really about measuring risk and liability and compliance because we don't operate a lot of the same systems we used to operate. There's services in a cloud for us. And even if we want to understand what they're doing, a lot of times it's, oh, yeah, we have a website. Go there. Look, we filed a form. And so, you know, I think where we've transferred time and energy in, did you set it up right on-prem? Did you configure it right on-prem so that you, as the custodian of this environment, have successfully indemnified yourself. I mean, we had networks, we had firewalls, we had data centers, we had all these things, and we understood those concepts, right? Now we're translating those things into behavioral constructs, which are always a little more interesting. But, you know, I think one of the funniest things for me was when Autopilot first launched as well. You have to have Autopilot. If you don't have Autopilot, you're not modern. If you're not modern, you're gonna die on the vine and you're not successful. Okay, right. it doesn't matter if it works. Well, that's irrelevant. Every book out here, every CIO weekly, every everything says this is it. And if you're not doing it, you're you're left behind. And we right. spend a lot of time. I much like the metric system, which, by the way, all we use it for in the U.S. is soda. But I was terrified that somebody would get hit by a car, need a hectoliter of blood. I wouldn't know how much that was. And that person would die. This is 1977 junior high. And I was terrified that somebody was going to die because of my ignorance of the metric system. Again. Soda. I know one liter's good, two liters goes flat. That's it. Yep. <laughs> and that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, part of these yeah. are conversations that have become very technical and very complicated. You know, I can't move a slider in one system and have it just affect one system anymore. And that's if you right. even understand what moving a slider means, because it's nice that we have a fuzzy UI that a tech can go and drag some levers back and forth these days, but there's there's no measurements in place for a lot of this to actually judge the outcome of what you've done. So we're getting into those moments. And again, I think this is more of that, you know, that revolutionary slash evolutionary and the, the change friction, some change friction 
you know, is, is noise, right? Somebody says, but I love this browser. I can never browse on anything else without it. If it doesn't have this letter or that letter in the upper left corner, the internet will stop running tomorrow. Okay, tech, tech religion, right? There are other things where we can literally say, look, once that, once that happens, you know, it's the door open, the hen house and the fox. If the fox is in, eventually you might get the fox back out, but the damage that's done may be unrecoverable at this point. So maybe we should pay a little more attention. Maybe we should learn a little more. And I think you're always going to have that. I'm in an industry, as you mentioned earlier, that is so diverse and so unbelievable. We are doing cutting edge patenting on, on technologies on one side. And I've got folks that are, you know, still trying to figure out why 8-bit isn't the answer, uh, you know, clear somewhere in the basement somewhere. And so it's always been that challenge, right? I've got to keep those who want to run with scissors corralled enough that if they do fall occasionally, they don't harm themselves irreparably. And at the same time, we've got to circle back and keep pushing the, the butt end of the elephant and going, you got to move. Um, we, we've stretched this bridge as far as we can. You got to move. And, you know, I think it is a little bit of art and science, but I think in the end, it's it's communication and understanding. And so my audiences are incredibly varied. Some are very technical. Some are very process driven. Some are very financially, you know, so part of the secret, I think, and it took me a while to get there is how do I make this relatable to them? Which part of the problem statement is their piece of the pie? And then ultimately, if theirs is the fiduciary decision, I can educate. I can arm to a certain extent with, you know, things that might catch you and slow you on the way out. But ultimately, even if I bolt the door and you're intent on getting out, you'll crawl up to the next level and find a window and go out or you'll do something else. So if I've educated and I've, to the extent that I can, protected, then I indemnify. And it's literally, if you guys are the fiduciary for this, you sign off on it, then, you know, I can't stop you. I can strongly encourage you not to do that. What will stop you is when something goes wrong and that'll be terrible because ultimately I'm both a fiduciary of this company and an owner in this company. And so I, I am protecting my investment as much as everything else around this company. And, you know, that that's how I think we continue to re-educate is we rehome the conversation on, you know, not, not morbidly what could go wrong, but if this situation arises, what's our plan to recover? And that forces folks to start walking through some of that. And eventually the light goes on and they go, well, wait a minute, how would we get that back? You, you it's gone. So, you know, that, that has become a lot more of my technical job these days in a technical role. It's, it's more soft in people skills some days. And it's trying to keep up, you know, the amount of change that's happening at the rate it's happening and in a manner or method in which it's happening. You know, most days I'm happy if I can find out within 24 to 48 hours that something new is loose in the world. Uh, you know, we used to have months to prepare. So it's, yeah. it's a new world. Something interesting, and I this is, I guess, probably my final question because we're starting to run out of time. But I think we, you and I were at Ignite or Inspire or one of those in Atlanta. We were having beers and just sitting and chatting and hanging out. It was a nice day. And you said something that really um, affected me. And it's something that I have kept in mind and made part of my talks and that and that was we were talking about the role of IT. And, and you said, I think the most, you know, I asked you, I'm like, you know, what's the most important thing as I'm working with IT pros, I'm working with, you know, heads of IT, et cetera, to think about. And you said something that really struck me, which is it's really important to understand what happens before and after your experience. And I said, what do you mean by that? Well, you have to know the people who are handing you these projects, what are their expectations, but also the folks on the other end, who are the people that are going to hand this off to you? And who do you hand this off to? And understanding that, not just working in this bubble and building that bridge between them is a critical part to success. And I've, I've really taken that and really looked to if I'm going to teach you how to use a piece of software, what are the things that happen before it gets to you in your process? And what are the things that are going to happen after your process? And even as training, it's really important to say, hey, when you hit send on this, this is what's going to happen. And if you've received this, here's what's happened up to this point. It not only humanizes the process, but also gets you to better understand cause and effect. And um, 
it, that has really stuck with me. And I thought kind of as our closing thoughts, if you could comment on that and what brought you to see things that way? How do you look at that before and after your role and help you to better define what success looks like for yourself? Yeah, I think the first realization I had with that is when, you know, the jobs that I was performing as I grew in the company eventually got to be more than I could do all by myself. And right. I think that's a critical learning curve for a lot of folks because for a long time, I, I was the designer. I was the engineer. I was the tester. And to the extent that I could push a button and make it go without anyone else stopping me, I was also the release vehicle. And I also had instantaneous feedback because they were all my systems. If something went haywire, I was the first to see them and probably the second to get the phone call. So that right. that closed system sort of ability to say, I, I understand where it came from, how I'm going to consume it, what I need to do to sort of push it out in the world, and most importantly, how to figure out whether or not what I did in the console turned into what I hoped to achieve on the endpoint or the mail system or the, you know, hey, I changed routing rules. Well, no one's getting mail. Oh, that was a bad idea. Let's right. Put them back. Um, now, right <laughs> after that, somebody should have said, why did you change routing rules? And then more importantly, what right. was it you hoped to achieve by changing the routing rule? And right. sort of walk that, right? And, and this is something to this day that I still walk into. It's I, I sit in a lot of design review sessions where someone says, here's what we're going to do right now. And we go, great, Ooh. that seems like a wonderful thing to do right now. What happens in a week when we hire new people, when people right. leave the company, when we need to transition this configuration, if we need to walk back from this? You know, I thought it was interesting and I, I learned this years ago in a prior life, uh, you know, in the aviation industry, but we did firefighter certification. And it was one of those things that, you know, seems like common sense until someone says it out loud. You know, it was never fight a fire going into a room where you don't know how to get back out. Right. You know, you don't race in and then look around and go, oh, God, what would I do? It's, you know, it's it's a meaningful approach with some thought into it. And sometimes it's a matter of saying, you know, it, it's not all ones and zeros, right? Someone has to go request this item. How do they do that? Right. What would I do if I started this process? Mm -hmm. I had to go from I'm the requester to I'm the fulfiller to I'm the technician, to I'm the notifier, to eventually I'm that same requester again. And and now I've been notified. And, and does that make sense to me? Because not all of that does. You know, how, yeah. how did I know you were done with the job? Well, we sent you an email. You sent me an email. What was I requesting? Well, an email account. I see. How would I have received the Receive email? that, yes. Or the yeah, account keep telling me how to hit one to continue the uh, back from the DOS days in the early XP it, days. It, exactly. That, so I think, you know, you know that's something. That. Yeah, that's something it took me a little bit of time to say, because, you know, for a lot of us, we're really busy. We have a lot of stuff thrown at us. It's always overdue and late when it gets there. You need it by five and it's 448. Uh, so sometimes it's tough to have that ability to say, I need some time to just say, Somewhere in this plan, somewhere in this adoption strategy, there should be a point of reflection where, again, we try to measure what did we intend to do and how do we prove that what we're about to do will achieve that. And some of those are soft things, you know, surveys, whatever. Some of those are very tangible things. But, you know, kind of leaving it on this note with someone I was I was having a, a rather spirited conversation where I thought we were getting to the point and we kept going backwards the other day. How do you know what you did was right? And they kept pulling up the yeah. console they were configuring and showing me the screen. And I said, no, I understand what you've set in the screen you're looking at appears right. to be what you wanted to achieve, but how do you know it worked? Right. Well, because, and then they kept falling back to the screen. I said, okay, let me, let me make this easier. This is going to change a configuration on a Windows endpoint. Yes. And it's a fairly important one that we make sure happens. Yes. Do you have a Windows endpoint? No. Okay, that's our first breakdown. Do you know someone that does? And more importantly, after targeting it for this configuration, how can we verify that that actually happened? Is it pull up a screen and the button went away? Is it dig into the registry and prove right. the number? Functionally, you're doing this for a reason. What is that reason? And right. how do I prove that it worked? And I think that today 
because so many people do just a piece of the puzzle anymore. And there's not folks like it was when I started out that were responsible for it. From cradle to grave. Right. Their part is push this button. I push this button. How do you know you were successful? Here's a screenshot to prove I pushed this button. Now it proves you did what we asked. It didn't prove that you were right. successful. Absolutely correct. Yeah. It's like, you know, I went to the store and, but you didn't bring home the milk. Yeah. You got to actually follow through. And follow through is key, I think. And again, I think this really hit it on the head for me is what happens before, what happens after, how do you show that things work? How are you connecting with your end users and getting feedback? It's a constant circle. You're never done. People and people enter that that you know, that cycle at different places. And it's keeping that in mind. This is absolutely true. One final bit of Pearl or bit or saying or thing that has helped you uh, throughout the years, and then we will close our conversation out. Yeah, I think if I would just finish the the sort of the three pillar that we've alluded to before, um, yeah. I've fallen back a lot on that. It's the can we, the should we, and then ultimately the will we. And I think the will we can be incredibly discouraging every now and then because the will we do something can be the least meaningful set of attributes that are applied to it. And, you know, one, one of the things I saw a long time ago here is I can do something. I can demonstrate that I can do it. I can even rally all of the data that proves that we should do it. But then right. ultimately it gets to layers much higher than all of us for the political will, the capital will, the, you know, whatever it is I need to green light this and finally get it done. Will I do this, even though I know it's something I should do, even though it's something I can do, and I'm lobbying for it, I wouldn't have spent all this time and effort on it if I didn't think we would do it, but somewhere near the very end of that process, someone pulls the funding or someone says, wait, I just realized this could affect me personally, now I'm no longer behind it. And, you know, understanding when you get to that point that if you've done everything right, you've positioned it right, and you've done your job, unless you're the king of the castle, so to speak, sometimes it just doesn't get done. And, you know, how to internalize that, not as a failure, but as a challenge to figure out how do we do this next time? Um, yeah. You're the organization. Yep. The bigger the organization, the bigger the animal you're trying to tame. And, you know, sometimes the tiger bites back. So awesome stuff. I love this. Tim, this was great. Next round is on me next time I see you for taking time out of your schedule uh, or several rounds, as it usually ends up with you and I, which is always nice. Where are you off to next? You, uh, Tim, enjoys traveling much the same way that I do. Anywhere interesting you're off to next? Yeah, we are actually in about a week and a half. Uh, we are headed to London for a long weekend to go see a Tottenham game. So uh, I have seen NFL games time. in that stadium, but I have yet to see a Spurs game in that stadium, which seems kind of backwards. But, uh, you know, the, the stars will I finally that, align. Uh, I think that will be awesome. I want to take a moment and thank everybody who showed up at my sessions, both at Educon in Chicago and showed up in Orlando. So great to see all of you. Met so many of you that told me you're watching the show, like the show, love the show. Thanks again for watching. Thank you again to my guest, Tim Aberley. We will see all of you in the next episode of Unplug IT. And once again, do not forget about our uh, Teams event on the 30th. We look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks again. Have a great day. And we'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.